One time, before there were any people walking around this valley, there were bear people, tells the Pacific Northwest author Barry Lopez. They had an agreement with the salmon. The salmon would come upriver every fall and the bears would acknowledge this and take what they needed. This is the way it was with everything. Everyone lived by certain agreements and courtesies. But the salmon people and the bear people had made no agreement with the river. It had been overlooked. No one thought it was even necessary. Well, it was. One fall, the river pulled itself back into the shores and wouldn't let the salmon enter from the ocean. And whenever they would try, the river would pull back and leave the salmon stranded on the beach. And there was a long argument and a lot of discussion. Finally, the river let the salmon enter. But when the salmon got up into the country where the bears lived, the river began to run into two directions at once, roaring, heaving white water and rolling big boulders up onto the banks. And then the river was suddenly still. Well, the salmon were afraid to move and the bears were standing behind the trees looking out, not sure what was happening. And the river said that there had to be an agreement. No one could just do something, whatever they wanted. You couldn't just take someone for granted. So for several days, they spoke about it. And the salmon said who they were and where they came from. And the bears spoke about what they did and what powers they'd been given. And then the river spoke about its agreement with the rain and the wind and the crayfish and so on. Everybody said what they needed and what they would give away. And then a very odd thing happened. The river said it loved the salmon. No one had ever said anything like this before. No one had taken this chance. But it was an honesty that pleased everyone. And it made for a very deep agreement among them all. So this story reminded me that everything operates best under mutually beneficial, intentional agreements. Agreements in which everyone's needs and gifts are taken into account. And such agreements and covenants have been the bedrock of our faith and of this community. Travel back with me now to 1658 when some of the covenantal roots of our Unitarian Universalist faith were established. Now, the Puritans had just arrived in New England, fleeing the monarchy in the restrictive Church of England, and their hope was to practice their faith more freely, away from the control of bishops and hierarchies that forbade individual interpretation of the Bible and small study group meetings. So with great intention and optimism, a group gathered at the Cambridge Meeting House in Boston to discuss how the new churches of Christ would be organized. From this, the Cambridge platform arose, a set of agreements that explained to its members and the church back home how their free churches would be organized here in the new world. And historian Alice Blair Wesley tells us that the platform describes how free churches are groups of people who have covenanted to walk together in the spirit of mutual love. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? The platform sets forth a covenant among members and churches with the emphasis on neighborly love while learning and growing what they call the complex ways of love, and love is complex, isn't it? So churches were to tend to one another without any higher outside authority other than God, and they were also to care for other congregations' welfare. And if someone didn't behave lovingly, members were expected to call that person back into a covenant of love, just like we do here in our fellowship. 
And if a neighboring church was having difficulties, it was incumbent upon nearby congregations to help them figure things out. And it was also expected that churches that grew too large would start new churches nearby. Based in Calvinist theology, the Cambridge platform aimed to follow the example of early Christian churches. It laid out rules for membership. And in fact, in those days, not for you guys, but in those days, repenting from sin and a professed belief in Jesus Christ were a prerequisite for membership. Very different than our current requirements for membership that you heard earlier. So in addition to membership, the platform established agreements around church officers, ministry, and cooperation between churches. And the Cambridge platform really laid the foundation for our contemporary governance structure known as congregational polity, as well as for the covenants within which we all operate. Now, for those of you who are members here, who are familiar with our chalice covenant of good relations, isn't it amazing to think about how far back the history of a covenant of love and right relations goes in our faith? I think it is, <laughs> even if you don't, <laughs> almost 400 years. And though we no longer adhere to many of the government's governance requirements of the Cambridge platform, since our theology and structure have changed over time, it's still important for demonstrating the deep roots of our congregational polity and its emphasis on learning to love and care for a community. So covenanted communities have arisen repeatedly in our faith. In the 1800s, there were various experiments with utopian communities focused around common values and hopes. In fact, from 1841 to 47, several Unitarian transcendentalists created the community of Brook Farm outside of Boston. And they hoped to balance labor and leisure while working together for the greater good of all. A wonderful idea, but sadly, this utopian experiment didn't last long due to financial constraints, which is always a problem when we have utopian ideals. <laughs> At this time, only churches were permitted to be part of the Unitarian Association. But over the years, the Unitarian Universalist Association began to broaden its regulations regarding congregations that could join the association. And as many members here know, between 1948 and 1967, the UUA promoted the fellowship movement. And that encouraged small groups of people, as few as 10, to come together and form house churches and small lay-led congregations. And that was actually, for those of you who don't know, how this congregation started in 1961, with a few families who wanted to create a liberal religious community in which to raise their children. And look at how we've grown. Over the last 10 years, the UUA has further expanded its definition of UU member congregations to include non-church communities called covenanting communities. And these alternative Unitarian Universalist spiritual and ethical communities take many forms, including artist collectives, small meeting groups, campus ministries, housing cooperatives, community centers, and many more. Being a covenanting community allows a group to stay rooted in Unitarian Universalism, even if it looks and works differently than a traditional congregation does. I want to share one such example with you. It was a Covenanting community in Washington, D.C. called the Sanctuaries. Founded by Reverend Eric Martinez Resley in 2013, the Sanctuaries, D.C. began as a group of artists committed to healing social divides and advancing social change. And Reverend Eric insisted that community is not about consumption. It's not what I can get out of a thing. Community is about co-creation. It's about how I can be of service to something greater than myself. And this service, this missional work of creating something greater than themselves became the driver of the sanctuaries coming together. 
Their members' core values led them to form a covenant that allowed them to flourish as a collective of racially and religiously diverse, creative artists. And I want to share their agreements with you because I think they're powerful and really inspiring. The first one is honor the spirit. We seek the sacred in everything and everyone. Then rise to your best. We make the ongoing choice to grow. Speak your truth. We welcome hard conversations. Trust the process. We pay attention to how we do what we do. Stay committed. We show up for ourselves and each other. Better together. We embrace our similarities and our differences. Isn't that beautiful? I was really moved by the simplicity and clarity of these agreements. And it seems a beautiful evolution from the complexity and length of the Cambridge platform. But sadly, I have to say that due once again to financial difficulties, the sanctuaries, I just got a message last month that they recently disbanded as an institution. But their important work continues in grooming leaders for creative social activism. And they aim to continue training leaders nationwide as spiritually grounded, socially engaged artists. And I wanted us to take a moment to honor their important calling and the work that they've been doing. I can rap. I got musical talents. Now, how am I going to use this to impact the greater community? The Sanctuaries is turning everyday citizens into socially engaged artists. They've developed the first program of its kind to help creative people connect their spiritual lives with their artistic practice and direct service of social change. I had a chance to get to know some amazing people. Um, I also had a chance to collaborate in ways that I may not have naturally done in my everyday life. What we created was amazing. Uh, I remember a song with the hook and I listened to the hook and I was literally in tears. I'm talking about on Metro, face drenched, you know, because it reached me. At a time when race and religion are dividing us apart, the program brings people of diverse cultural and spiritual backgrounds together in a community of shared learning and collaboration. It allowed me to work past a lot of the, you know, misconceptions I had on other people. It's brought me closer to spirituality and helped me recognize things that I want to work on for myself. This is the first time I ever got a stand ovation um, in my life and for it to be because of a piece of art that I did to promote social change through soulful arts. It was like a, a energy boost for my soul. For the program pilot, participants collaborated with Empower DC to gain first-hand experience working on grassroots justice campaign. Who doesn't want to change the world? Who doesn't want to make it a better place? Um, but to have a space, uh, a program that actually facilitates that for you and helps you helps guide you to to make that change or to to work together with others to make that change um, that's huge. Participants use the creative arts to amplify the voices of public housing residents fighting displacement in Barry Farms Anacostia. You can't just post on Twitter and Instagram and call yourself an activist like you have to actually go in there meet the people and sit back and put your ego out of it and be like what do you need me to do? One of the things that residents requested was a theme song that would inspire them to keep fighting. So participants collaborated with 14-year-old rapper and Berry Farms resident, Jay Rico. Nothing can erase this To be honest, I don't think that is right. You take everything from the blacks and give everything to the whites. I'm from the farms where single mothers had to fight. To make sure I was safe from gunshots every night. I love that song. I love how you uplifted Rico and how you know you all were like on the ground. You all didn't have to go through a whole lot of red tape. You showed that you were serious. You got in the community. You talked to somebody and they had a dream. They had a talent. And you saw that. You didn't try to co opt it. You didn't try to change it. You let Rico be Rico. And I love that. In the future, the Sanctuaries plans to scale the program nationally 
in order to mobilize the next generation of spiritually grounded and socially engaged artists. When I first came, I was still questioning what I had to offer. I now know that my voice has a purpose and a place not only in this community, but in the world. To learn more and to get involved, visit thesanctuaries.org. Isn't that inspiring? And there are many such communities forming all over the country. The sanctuaries figured out a way for really different people to bridge their divides and come together to support one another spiritually and creatively, to help birth new ideas and forward social justice around the country. And as one of our most experimental cutting edge covenanted spiritual communities. And there are many others throughout the nation now growing like tender new shoots from our faith. Groups bound together by a passion for justice, creativity and spirituality, pushing the boundaries of traditional religious community. The Lucy Stone Housing Cooperative is a Unitarian Universalist housing collective that worships, lives and eats together or Sacred Fire, which are replicable UU covenanted communities that train spiritual activists around the country. Now, unfortunately, most of these communities are struggling financially because of our capitalist system, which doesn't necessarily value what they offer. So according to a 2018 article in Psychology Today by Niob Wei, we long to bond and cooperate as a species. But, as she warns, we live in a society that is rooted in beliefs and ideologies that prevent us from having what we want and need most to thrive. Patriarchal ideologies, for example, lead us to privilege stereotypically masculine qualities over those deemed feminine, she writes. And she goes on to say, we value self over relationships, individual success over the common good, the mind over the body, and thinking over feeling. Such priorities and preferences devalue core elements of our humanity and contribute to a decline in familial and communal bonds and a disconnection from oneself and others, Way writes. Yet this creation and sustenance of covenantal communities, which emphasize the good of the collective, are so vital at this time, aren't they? Neo Wei reminds us that from the Gospels of Jesus to Pope Francis's call for a revolution of tenderness, from the work of Albert Einstein to the Dalai Lama, we hear the message that love is the solution a love that includes the self and is rooted in justice and a sense of common humanity. So as we celebrate our seventh principle for Chalaka today, we give thanks for the power of our interconnectedness and our sense of a common humanity. This covenantal interconnected way of being with one another is really at the core of our faith. For many other religions, the first most important covenant is with God. But for us, for us, my friends, the, the most significant covenant is with one another. And through those commitments to love, even when it's hard, we live into the holy. In a society in which people are increasingly alone and isolated, we can feel the importance of interconnectedness and community, can't we? When someone is sick or hurting, the ripples of their struggle echo among many of us and we hold them in our love and care and tend to their needs. When someone has fallen on hard times, or is going through a divorce, or a great loss, we rally together to support them. In community, we have the chance to practice forgiveness, kindness, and love. We have the opportunity to experiment with being people of our word, 
people who are generous, people who care more about the greater good than their individual well-being. And we have the chance to practice being in right relationship with relative strangers, to assume good intentions of one another and to speak directly with one another when difficulties arise. We get the opportunity to practice radical hospitality towards all, including people who are marginalized and rejected by much of society. These communal and spiritual and ethical covenants that we share are not easy to live into, but we try. As our beloved hymn says, we forgive ourselves and each other and we begin again in... Again and again, we return to this community to practice being better versions of ourselves and into places that are challenging. We can return knowing that we are all working on this together. We're all doing our best. And that is powerful. These covenants we have with one another are so different from how our wider society is currently operating, aren't they? A society which emphasizes the individual's well-being above that of the collective, a society which allows millions of people to not have enough food on their table or even a home, a society which ignores people who are struggling with mental illness, a society which does not welcome the outsider or those who are marginalized, a society which vilifies asylum seekers and immigrants, a society which destroys the beautiful earth that upholds us, a society which prefers to wage war than peace. But this is not who we are at our core, is it? This is not what great spiritual teachers such as Jesus, Muhammad, and the Buddha modeled for us, is it? They modeled love and inclusion. They demonstrated opening our hearts to the least among us, working together to create a better world. They modeled peace and compassion. At our core, we long for these spiritual qualities, don't we? We ache for connection, belonging, and justice for all. We desire a world of kindness and integrity, don't we? So that, my friends, is where awe comes in. I think what we're doing here is awesome. And that word can be used lightly, but it's actually a big word not being swallowed up by our baser nature and continually striving for beloved community is worthy of awe, don't you think? Yes. After all, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us that our ultimate end must be the creation of beloved community. So let us remember the deep agreements that the salmon, the river, and the bears made to one another. Let us be inspired by the Cambridge platform and how it called us to live lovingly together. Let us not forget the beautiful promises guiding the sanctuary's community. And above all, my friends, let us remember the covenant that we have made with one another and our beloved chalice community. Are you in? You bet. Yeah. I leave us with a quote by the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. It is probable that the next Buddha will not take the form of an individual. The next Buddha may take the form of a community, a community practicing understanding 
and loving kindness, a community practicing mindful living. This may be the most important thing that we can do for the survival of the earth. A covenanting community such as this, my friends, is a gift. May we honor it. May we nourish it with our commitment, tend to it with our gifts, and bring to it our open hearts, our embracing arms, and our caring minds. Amen. <laughs>